Welcome back to Artificial Antics, where Rico and Mike will talk about the implications and opportunities around artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. In today's episode, The Business of AI, an entrepreneur's view with Dave George, Mike and Rico will explore AI's business impact, innovative solutions, and future trends with telecom veteran Dave George. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Mike from Artificial Antics. Uh, I'm joined here today by my co-host, Rico. How are you doing, everybody? Uh, it's Rico here again, and with, we're back in the lab talking to a friend of the show, entrepreneur and CEO, Dave George. <laughs> nice to see you guys. So first, let me introduce myself to your audience uh, for those that don't know me. Um, Dave George, uh, pretty much born into the uh, telecom uh, and ISP uh, space. Um, my family has a uh, an ILEC that was started in 1909. That's still going strong. Um, started an ISP back in the 90s. Um, so again, um, you know, come from a uh, a long background of telecom, uh, cable TV, and uh, internet service provider uh, companies. Um, I am the co-founder of Green Star Marketing, which is a telecom centric or techcom, uh, as I prefer to say, centric. Uh, marketing firm. Um, and then of course, uh, about two years ago, I co-founded uh, with some really smart guys, uh, a company called P2P Tech, uh, which is a um, high level tier three, tier four type support uh, organization that also does software development. Um, and uh, uh, we are going to be releasing this month a product called Helios, which is an omni-channel CX with generative AI uh, solution. So uh, I thought it was appropriate to you know, to come on this show and, and, and talk to you guys. Uh, and then to answer your question, Mike, about IT Expo, mm -hmm. um, IT Expo was uh, uh, back, yeah, it was just a few weeks ago back in Florida, uh, Fort Lauderdale to be exact. Um, very, uh, very nice show, very well attended, lots of different vendors, um, and it really covers the entire communications sector. So it's not just generative AI, although that is one of the newer, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, organizations, if you will, or, or events at that show, but it's even got IOT, uh, 5G, um, UCAS and CCAS, uh, you know, um, and so, you know, when you attend that event, you really do get a nice swath of everything communications. Awesome. That that's super exciting. And yeah. then, so the, the generative AI conference there at IT Expo, that is that new this year or did they actually have that last year as well? Um, I was there last year, and if it was available last year, it certainly wasn't hyped uh, to the okay. same degree as this year. So if there was a generative AI breakout session, I don't know if it was labeled generative AI. It might have been okay. labeled just machine learning or AI, or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe it was just part of uh, you know the, the, the whole event without having a, a subset of, uh, of breakout sessions. Um, this year, there was no question that generative AI was the hype to use that word again. Yeah. Um, even in the IoT session, generative AI came up uh, in the conversation and, and really almost, you know, for a few minutes in the one session I was in really took main stage, if you will. So okay. you know, this topic of generative AI is definitely on everyone's mind um, that was at the IT Expo show. Awesome. So with um, with the generative AI conference, uh, what uh, I know, I'm sure there were different breakout sessions and whatnot. What were were some of the uh, breakout sessions you were able to attend? And like, what were people? So IoT, they were talking about that. Uh, what else were they talking about there? Um, so the one that I really remember was uh, a session on um, rich call data. Right. So you have to remember that this event has a lot of telephony providers, yeah. right? Communications providers um, that might be doing video, they might be doing a, you know, a, a phone on your desk, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, or even things that are adjunct like predictive analytics or voicemail transcription, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And this idea of identity protection came up, right? Because AI is getting smarter, faster than I think people um, can handle. Um, yeah. Yep. You know, there were some examples of uh, even simple things like email where AI has gotten much better at creating a fake email. Um, and so yeah. the topic was, well, how do you protect yourself? And then that was, um, you know, verified mark certificates was one of the things that was brought up that, hey, mm -hmm. maybe it's time to have emails that are certified, kind of like an SSL cert mm -hmm. or some other type of uh, auth authentication, if you will. And I thought that was really interesting because you know, you think about AI and so you start thinking future and very high tech. And here's a here's a transportation device email that's been around for years. And AI is still causing that 
ripples and effects that need to be addressed. Um, so, you know, it's not just high tech, it's low tech as well that we need to think about. Right. Yeah, you know, that's that's actually, so that's super interesting. And I forget which uh, which camera manufacturer is building in like a digital, you know, you're talking about low tech and that's images. Right. right. You can't, you know, I believe it when I see it. Well, right. now there's all kinds of stuff that people are, you know, deep fakes <laughs> and everything. So they're actually building in the technology to, to um, it, it's, it's like a super deep watermark that you can see if that image was either recreated, regenerated, um, tra it, it trained a model and it's completely traceable, which uh, lends well to uh, the AI, uh, the AI uh notion of transparency right you want it, it want you want it to be transparent what the origin is how you got there right and uh and how why'd you give me this answer right why you know is is this image ai is this image not ai right it, and so uh so yeah that i mean just you know thinking about that and having the um you know an identification protection too i mean that's huge right you're talking about uh call data and whatnot protecting the Correct. privacy, right, of the data yeah. is important. Well, I mean, you, you know, uh, we'll talk about the panel I was on, but I had mentioned during my panel the uh, the deep fake that happened in New Hampshire back in January. Yes. Yep. And having a certificate or some met method of being able to know that this isn't the real voice of the president of the United States, for example, right. I think is, is right. extremely important. And I try to touch upon the fact that that's really like foundationally the trust of our government, the trust of the people speaking. Um, I mean, that's, that's pantomount to, you know, a stable nation state, as I would call it. Like you need, we need that, uh, regardless of what party you like, don't like the, the concept of a democracy or at least a representative democracy, we need to have that trust. Um, so I think when it comes to video or audio, Mike, having that watermark, having that, you know, identity protection, if you will, um, I think is, is, is extremely important. Um, I, I wish I could say that at the show, there were a ton of solutions offered. Um, there were a few, I offered one or two of myself, um, but at least people were thinking about it. They, they, they realize that this problem is going to continue to grow. It's gotta be resolved. Um, they can't rely just on regulatory and governance from the government to make this happen, that this has to happen at the enterprise level, has to happen for SMBs who want to implement those safeties, um, regardless of the size of the organization. Yep. We we, uh, we did an AI panel, what was it, a week or two ago, and one of the things that came up there was kind of in, in line with this, and it was the mass adoption of AI and the fact that a lot of people don't recognize it when they see it. So having those other, you know, those methods for authentication really work for those who don't want to get themselves involved with it. And we, we right. kind of chuckle because we see a lot of folks that are, uh, fall victim to it, not just, you know, the, the deep fakes like you're talking about, but also just generative art that, you know, we could take a look at it and go, well, that's clearly AI and a lot right, of folks right. don't know how to discern. So yeah, that mass adoption right. will be very important. Authentication. Yes. Yep. I think that's yes. And that mass adoption, uh, that, that mass adoption of those protections will help the adoption of people wanting to use AI. No yep. question. Safety. Right. Yep. It goes hand in hand. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it, it, exactly. And one quick tip too. Uh, now the reality is like, sure, there are bad actors and, and this isn't going to protect you in all instances. Right. But one thing I would completely suggest is if you do a, an AI voice, you train an AI voice, you train an AI video avatar, it's extremely important on those accounts to have like two factor authentication and make sure that those are really well protected because the reality is like your likeness being able to be reproduced, you want to protect that as much as possible, right? You can't protect it. Uh, you know, hundred percent, but you do whatever you can do to, to not like, you know, you, you don't want to train your AI voice in somebody <laughs> else's 11 labs account. How's that? Right. Yeah, it's, right. Worth the 11, it's worth the 11 bucks, um, <laughs> you know, to just pay for the monthly. Well, and I thought right. it was kind of interesting too, because 11 labs now, uh, is giving voice royal royalties too. So you could sell your voice on there, which I was like, I would never do that. Like, yep. I, right. uh, you, you can uh it's not something that that's for me right so uh so yeah so that's interesting uh now as far as uh that's a good segue into too like you mentioned you were on a panel there dave mm -hmm. uh do you want to tell us a little bit about the panel and you know kind of what it was about sure um so the 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 title of the panel 
uh, was generative AI, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and it was moderated and emceed by uh, Bill Miller, who is an industry veteran, you know, 50 years in telecom, everyone knows him. And, you know, the subject matter was basically um, three uh, CEOs on the panel, uh, each coming from a different perspective in the communication sector. So um, you had Dan Rosenrausch, uh, he is the CEO of a company called Virtue. Um, they're a white label provider for UCAS uh, based out of the uh, Tampa, Florida uh, area. Um, and then you had Bill McLean. They call him Phone Bill uh, because he pretty much has created a really good online presence um, on LinkedIn. Um, he's definitely in the top 1%. Okay. Um, and, you know, he's got a great, uh, a great presence in the industry. Everyone knows him. And so he was there as the CEO of his company, Stratostyle. Um, uh, and he's also just started, uh, along with a, a couple other people, a company called Upon AI, which is an IVR engine, um, for, uh, u- utilizing, uh, generative AI. Um, and so, and then of course you have myself, um, which, uh, was representing both, you could argue the marketing aspect of mm-hmm. AI, but also then, you know, the software development and, uh, other factors of AI, you know, for back office and, uh, infrastructure and, and so forth. So, you know, he had three very different perspectives there. Um, you know, one who just started an AI company, obviously, uh, is gonna have a different, per, uh, opinion perhaps on the benefits of AI versus the, the bad and the ugly, if you will. Right. Right. I definitely came across as the guy that was talking about some of the bad and the ugly, yeah. although I'm an advocate for AI. I want to be very clear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I'm developing it. I'm offering a product, mm-hmm. you know, so it's not like uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm um, against AI, if that's yeah. the that's thing. But uh, I do understand the social implications. You know, uh, I have evaluated it based on, you know, our job displacement concerns that some mm-hmm. people have or you know just the aspects of you know we talked about mike in the past uh, things like uh, social media you know and the fact Gosh. that ai didn't quite get it right with our society for social media perhaps right right um and so you know um, so there's a human aspect that i think is interesting with ai that shouldn't be forgotten um and so i did bring up some of those things on the uh, the panel um mm-hmm. you know which i definitely you know, I, I definitely saw some some questions from the audience um they asked you know for example um they asked uh, you know well is there a solution to help you know wrap uh i use that word like a wrapper around ai mm-hmm. uh, and i did mention cisco's uh, motific that's coming out later this year uh, which is basically an application that verifies it it it, it basically is an ai authenticator or a verification mm-hmm. um but it's going to give you that compliance it's going to give you that uh, risk assessment um so i think that's certainly a solution mm-hmm um, the other one I was talking about, Mike, uh, at another panel um, um, at the same trade show um, was the IBM Watson X, um, right? Yeah. Um, now, Watson X is their claim to fame, at least this is what I'm understanding, is that they will absolutely indemnify uh, the user of the AI from third party uh, claims for intellectual property theft. Now, right. I haven't done enough research to tell you what all that means. I'm sure there's fine print, but the point I'm making is, is that there are companies that are absolutely seeing the arms race for AI being deployed and people trying to get it out. Uh, and then there's these companies like Cisco and IBM that are saying, yes, that's great. And we're doing that too, but we're also going to provide these solutions that are going to give you some of these protections that are missing, um, like the governance, um, you know, like being able to, um, you know, see what the LLM or OLM is doing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's, I think there's, so when I say there's the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, some of the bad and ugly, the hallucinations that we've read about, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. deception in some very odd cases that we've even heard about. um, Those are, you know, those need to be addressed. And I think some of these software solutions that we're hearing about um, uh, that are using AI, by the way, in some cases, um, uh, I think can provide that, that oversight um, and that confidence, um, which leads to trust, right? And that's really what this is all about. Yep. It, it, it's those five letters, T-R-U-S-T. If we have trust in the, uh, in the AI, uh, then we're going to use it and we're going to feel confident in using it. I, I, I'm going to like kind of pitch back to the panel. So I think there was a, a very valid point brought up uh, between you and I forget the other gentleman's name. Uh, he was wearing suspenders and the white shirt on there. Um, you guys were talking about the governance and, and uh, the example of TikTok was brought up and how far behind the times, you know, some of the people who are making these laws are with that legislature. And that's, that's a very valid point. 
um, because we know how rapidly it's evolving. And if laws can't catch up and then you have folks that really are going to stifle AI because of sure fear and panic, you know, um, where, where do you think that's going to take us? What you think we're going to see some legislature here coming up? So there already is some legis- uh, legis- legislature and regulatory already being implemented, like, for example, for the deep fakes, right? They've already come out with legislation that basically says that an artificial voice is just that. It's artificial and they can prosecute much faster. Um, so um, we shouldn't be completely um, concerned about regulatory not being able to keep up in some cases. However, um, I think I jokingly said on the panel and robocalling, which has been a problem for up. years, yep. has just been solved. It's we're, we're good to go. And here we are in 2024 and they're still trying to figure out how to address different types of robocalling. Um, and I even brought up on the panel that if you were to lock down robocalling, you technically are then hurting software development, AI yep. development yep. for, and I use, I think, an example of inside sales calling, right? The fact that it's, I would yes. want to have inside sales being driven by an AI, right. but it's a legitimate company. Yep. So now we're back to these verifications and certs, right? But yep. again, yeah. now you have more oversight. Now it's heavier. So we have to try to find this balance and the government doesn't always get it right. Correct. Um, right. Yeah. You know, so, you know, uh, and that's, and that would be the concern there, right? Is I don't want to stifle creativity. I don't want to st- stifle the ability for businesses to grow. Right. I mean, AI, when used correctly, does level the playing field for a smaller business to compete with an enterprise based business um, in that same space. Um, if you start to put a lot of regulatory that adds cost, and additional personnel required. Well, then what ends up happening is you either have to build an AI for that, uh, no pun intended, okay. or you literally, you know, have this extra cost. So then you're stifling the smaller, uh, the smaller providers, if you will. So to answer your question, um, or to wrap that question up, I would say we definitely have to help the lawmakers get it right. Um, I still think it's partly on us as well, though. Like, mm-hmm. what sure. do we want to see? You know, yeah. collectively in this space. You know, is it just an arms race? Do we just want to get stuff out without any oversight, without any, you know, throw caution to the wind right. and, and let the user beware? Um, or do we want to try to have something that, you know, is meaningful? Um, you know, we talk, I talk about the arms race here for this type of software, this type of uh, AI. Um, you know, and I always hear people say, well, what about North Korea? What about China? And again, I believe all evidence to the contrary. I think most of the time they do a great job of keeping up with the Joneses, but they don't necessarily always innovate. So right. I don't think that China is necessarily going to, you know, beat us at this arms race right. um, just because we want to put some oversight on top of it. So again, well, I, I think, think that, I, oh, go please, ahead. please, please. Yeah, no, well, please, I was going to say it almost perpetuates them wanting to with trying Absolutely. to lock the different things down. So right. they're, now, now they're building like a wafer chip that can process in parallel simultaneously with over 2000 cores to right. be able to, to keep up, right? They're coming up with what I'm going right. to call out of the box or, um, you know, outside of the box solutions because they're forced to, right? Rather right. than just leave it, you know, I, I, I get it, I but, but it, it's not always beneficial because sometimes doing things like that and locking things down alerts somebody to the fact that they should be doing more than maybe they would if they just naturally let things run its course. Right. So many times it was the United States that invented something that then was cloned, copied or, you know, mass produced. So, you know, we just have to keep that in mind. There there needs to be a healthy respect in all regards. Right. Um, You know, now the cat's out of the bag, right. We're building this thing. Like this is going like, there's no, there's no putting it back in the bag. And I don't think we'd want to, Um, you know, so going back to the panel, the good, um, you know, some of the really good stuff that, that I, that I would mention would be things like obviously, you know, robotic AI, you know, someone who's paraplegic, uh, can now walk. Uh, I would, I would never take that away. Or, uh, I, I think you guys on your show mentioned be my eyes. Yes. What a great organization. And, you know, it's funny when I was watching that episode of your show, my, I don't know if you know this, my grandfather started um, the leader dog for the Lions Club back in the late 60s, oh, okay. early 70s here in this mid-Atlantic region um, where I'm based out of. And so, you know, I, he's not alive, obviously, today, but it would be great to, to ask him, hey, 
you were delivering German shepherds and golden retrievers back in 1968, 1972, et cetera. Um, what do you think about this? And then be able to talk about how AI can let the person have spatial acuity, mm-hmm. know it's in a refrigerator, know what food they can make with the ingredients in the refrigerator, yep. and then give them the ability to know how to cook it, where to cook it. I, I mean, I, I, I would be curious to ask him, you know, what he thought of that, that progression in um, being, you know, um, able to do things by yourself. Yeah. In other words, to be able to be right. empowered to do those things um, you know, uh, using be my eyes, for example. So there's even cancer research has come such a long way in the last few years, just with AI and machine learning. Right. So those are the good, you know, the bad would be some of those hallucinations where, um, you know, AI is basically doubling down on the answer it gave you, even though, you know, it's wrong, right. That to me is a hallucination, right. It's, it's, it's trying to forcefully tell you it's right, even though it's wrong. And then the ugly, um, I think I touched upon this a little bit, was the Apollo Research um, article that I read um, where, you know, under stress, a certain large language model um, basically deceived um, the users of it. And I definitely think the word deceive is a very appropriate word for that particular scenario. And it's a unique scenario. I want to be clear. Yeah. I want to see one watching your episode. But it, it still brings up the larger question of who's accountable who's responsible and what do you do when it happens? Because if it's deceiving, how do you even know it occurred? Right. Right. Which, which, yeah, which is lends well to having the transparency. And, you know, it was interesting. You mentioned Watson X and then, you know, indemnifying and basically, you know, there are different levels and each of the companies I'm looking at, you know, they're, they're, they're handling it a little differently. Right. Mm -hmm. Anthropic, who funny enough is trying to be the most responsible AI. They don't indemnify you at all. Like it's all on you, right? Literally. They're like, it's all on you. It's the person who types the buttons and something accidentally happens. It's not, it's not us. Right. Whereas ChatGPT and OpenAI, their take is they will try it. I, you know, they'll they'll come in, you know, give you legal, whatever, all these things. You're still going to have to like run through a bunch of stuff though. It's going to be really annoying. Right. Right. Whereas like, and then I I feel like Watson X might (laughs) even take it to the next level where it's like, we are going to be in place of you take the full brunt of this, right? Which, right. so there are varying degrees that these companies are are protecting their user base. And I think that's an interesting, uh, you know, I, I would expect no less, but I think it's interesting that they're all doing something a little different. I, yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, listen, 20 years ago, you know, we didn't have AI, uh, at least not to this level. We had machine learning perhaps, but um there always was, you know, different types of employee practices, liability insurance, errors and emission insurance. Yep. So, I mean, does this just open up a whole nother, um, you know, form of insurance that we're all going to have to purchase both at the B2C level as well as the B2B level, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you're uh, using this, you know, if you're using AI, are you culpable, right? I mean, if I hold a hammer and I accidentally you know, hit someone's property, uh, it's an accident, but I'm accountable and I need my insurance to cover this. So, so the question is, is, you know, what is that liability? Where does, where is that line drawn? Um, and I'm sure there are scenarios here that I have, have, have not even envisioned that are going to make, you know, law very interesting. And I'm sure there's a whole segment of lawyers that are gearing up to be able to, uh, you know, um, litigate that. Um, but I think it comes down to Mike standardization, right? In other words, we need, we need something that's standardized. We need something that's templatized. I need, I mean, just as a business owner, right? I'm, I, I, again, I am not necessarily writing code, right? So I'm not, you know, I, I, I see AI as a tool, a very powerful tool, but it's just a tool, but help me use it. Give me a virtual assistant that shows me the risk assessment out of the gate. Like get, get, give me the tools for me to, to monitor. Uh, I think we talked about, you know, monitoring my, my team. I want to know what they're, what are the user responses and, and user prompts? What's the LLM feeding back as an answer? Like, is right. it, is it, is it accurate? Um, you know, now do I have time to, to read all of that and to sift through that? No, I'm going to ask for a third party AI to do that for me. But right. isn't that similar to a predictive analysis and incentive analysis software that does that today, where it listens to a third, you know, as a third party, if you will, 
listens to uh, a voice recording or video recording and it scores it and it provides a, a, a feedback and sentiment and so right. forth. I right. think there's, I think there's a whole slew of things that could solve some of these problems, but, um, but again, so far, I feel like, you know, for some small businesses and CEOs that are, you know, maybe um, trying to figure out where to go with this, um, I think a lot of them still feel like they're on their own. Like they don't know where to lean on. Um, some mm-hmm. are being told to hire an AI specialist as part of their organization for 2024 and 2025. Mm-hmm. And then they go on, you know, they go on LinkedIn, they go on Indeed and what am I, they don't even know what they're hiring. What, what, what am I looking for? Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. what's the basis exactly. for that training and education? And one of the things too on that panel with with talking about policy, uh, you were the only person when they asked about, you know, does anybody have a policy regarding AI? You were the only one that kind of like put his hand up and looked around like, uh, where do we get the policy from? You know, what do you, what do you base a policy on? And and, uh, I think that makes you feel very alone as a CEO or somebody responsible for a company is where do you get the language from? Of course, you're going to consult lawyers, but what's the standard, I guess. That's that's a great question because my policy was drafted by basically talking to the MC that was at that panel, uh, Bill Miller, and then creating my own guide rails based on his recommendations that he's seen as a consultant for other companies that are that are larger than than my companies, right? So that's basically what I did. So I didn't mm-hmm. I didn't write it from scratch. Right. I yeah. took his framework and and basically you know created my own, you know. But but that, that's that's even a bigger question, right? Which is you're, you're providing a framework and a, and, a, and a policy for your team, but there's still the moral and ethical issue right. that doesn't align or doesn't necessarily work with the digital AI framework and issues. So it's a lot harder to write than you might think because they, they're, they're not aligned, right? And, right. And, and, and the question I have would be, and can they be? So I can give I can give a take on this, Dave, because of course, being at the forefront of this stuff, we we've, we've mm-hmm. had a policy at Clarity for quite some time, right? Okay. Now, it wasn't super forthcoming in the in the beginning, but here's how I started because you have to start, right? If you're yep. going to finish something, you got to start. For one, I talked to our HR department and our HR firm that manages that side of the house, right? Uh, they had some rough language and thoughts on it. I took that. Right. It was very basic. It was not what we were going to use. So here's the next step. I said, okay, that's cool. Here's what I'd like to do. Let's go through our handbook, determine what our rules of engagement are now. And it kind of like the marrying of like, what, what are the no brainers? What are the things that are in the handbook now? And right. let's make, let's start there, right? Let's ensure that you, you wouldn't throw secret sauce knowledge out on the internet and you right. also wouldn't throw secret sauce knowledge into AI, right? Yeah. You wouldn't throw our full customer list <laughs> and our sales numbers exactly for every right. month broken down by brand out right. on the public internet. And you also wouldn't throw that into chat GPT, right? So that's kind of where we started. And then we built around that. And I think what we have in our handbook now, and, and there's also a couple different approaches because you could have kind of a permissive approach where, yep. hey, we want to innovate, but we also want to be careful and protect our data, our customers' data. And right. then there's also the kind of like, you cannot do this, right? So some companies will take different approaches. We sort of met in the middle on that. And yeah. we, we essentially, there are some things that it's like, do not use. Um, Actually, Martha from our company came up with something that was great. Do a do not do list, a do <laughs> not do list for AI. So we have that right. as part of it too. And right. it, so it makes it very clear as to, okay, here's the acceptable use. Here's the, you know, uh, the stuff you should look out for. And then here's like the do never do this. Right. right. And right. it's the same, same type of stuff you would expect in an employee handbook. It, there, no, no there's do what. not do things. Right. Right. So, right. so that, that was our approach to it. But interestingly enough, I was at a, um, a, a entrepreneur summit over the last week, uh, down, down by you, uh, or well down, uh, not by you, but by where you were with ITX, but we were in uh, West Palm. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, so there were a bunch of entrepreneurs there and, and they they did an AI, AI panel for really smart guys. But one yeah. of the guys said, Hey, we've got kind of, you know, our, you know, our framework for how AI can be used. How many of you would be interested? How many of you have this already? 
Like, I swear there were three people who raised their hand. Yes. How many people would be interested in seeing mine so you could start to pl plan on writing yours? And like everybody's hand raised, right? <laughs> yeah. So the reality is like, we we are up well ahead. And so, and that's not the only thing. It's not just about the policies. It's about the uses too, right? Like, um, I think that a lot of people understand that this is powerful in some way, but like, give me your take on, you know, the CEOs that you've been talking to just in the business in general, what's the overall uh, climate of, of people's attitudes and thoughts? So I, I think it depends on where they are in the adoption of AI, right? So many of the uh, CEOs uh, and C-level that I'm talking to um, that haven't really adopted anything, they're waiting for basically one of their vendors to provide a solution that they can just take to market. So let's look at it that way, mm -hmm. right? They're not going to develop their own. They're not trying to be cutting edge or fleeting edge. They just are going to wait for the vendor. They're not sure what this means yet. Like, I think they're still, they know it's going to be, um, you know, in their, in their roadmap for 2024, 2025, but they're not, I think they're going to wait for the vendor to release a, a product. When I say a vendor that's, that's integrating into a solution, they're already, offering. So if Microsoft is going to add a copilot yeah. like they did, now they're going to have it in their O365 offering. That's mm -hmm. just their team's offering. That's yep. just the way it's going to be. Um, and I think it's going to be the same with their UCAS and CCAS. I think it's going to be the same with their video. Same thing with cybersecurity, anything where it's a plug-in or an add-on. Mm -hmm. and, and in the CEO's mind, this is incremental revenue, right? So for them, this is, I've already got a solid customer relationship and now I'm going to add incremental revenue here, which is great to an existing customer. So I'm farming that base, if you will. Right. So that's how a lot of them are looking at it if they haven't really done anything with it yet. Then you have the ones that I would say have launched maybe or are allowing their team to play with one or two um, types of AI, probably a chat GPT-4. I hear that a lot. Yeah. That, that seems to be, I put this in quotes, the safe one. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also hear people talking about using Gemini, Octo AI, uh, Anthropic, I think, Mike, you mentioned earlier, or yep. Rico, you mentioned. Um, so you have people playing with some of those things, but they're using it for um, very specific use cases. Like, you know, if their finance department is one person and they don't want to hire a second person, they're, they're hoping that AI can do some of the calculations, some of the spreadsheet reviews, being able to help them with their QuickBooks, right? Because a lot of these companies are smaller. They don't have, you know, a larger accounting software. So you know, this might help them with some of that uh, tabulation. Mm -hmm. um, and then the ones that have gone and really embraced it, they've done been very specific. So I can think of a couple in my mind here um, without listing names, mm -hmm. but they've done something like a CPAS offering where the AI is delivering on that CPAS offering to provide those resources, uh, you know, DIDs, phone numbers, um, all, all the intelligence behind it in a very quick, easy fashion. Uh, another one is using AI to deliver, um, the voicemail and auto attendant prompts in a very easy way, uh, actually on the platform, Mike, that you run at Clarity. Yeah. So, th so I'm just, I'm seeing very specific use cases when it's someone going, you know, going that way. Um, but I can tell you, I would say in the SMB and small enterprise space, I still see a lot of just dipping toes in ponds. Yes. So no AI summaries, you know what I mean? Right. Hey, we got AI summary now. That's great. You and every, literally everybody else, everybody has AI summary. Uh, yes. It was one of the first things. First, it's like a no brainer. Out. You just do it. Yeah. You just do it. And now we have it. Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, another thing I was talking to our CEO, Gary, and you know, he, the other day, and it really hit me and he's right. He's like, you know, I'm looking at how Teams does transcription and he's like, and you know, some of these other vendors, they just do it. They, there's no extra cost or whatever. Mm -hmm. He's like, I feel like at this point, like transcription and at least basic sentiment analysis is like literally table stakes. Yeah, Everybody is. is doing it. Everybody. So if you yes. want to differentiate and we were talking uh, before about, you know, Steve Jobs and innovating, it's not mm -hmm. adding transcription sentiment or AI summaries to your product, right? There's got to, there's got to be more. And I was listening to yes. uh, something the other day and it was, it was an AI podcast. And, uh, and the guy was talking about, he said the businesses that are really succeeding with AI now are the ones that adopted AI seven years ago and have right. been working on this. And they, because what he was talking about is the challenges of, you know, ML, ML, ML ops, which is machine learning operations. And truly yes. like you can have a lot of ideas, 
but getting it to actually be deployed and and the most more importantly adopted right like by your team and yep, you know right. getting that that roi or roe return on effort right is right. extremely challenging it's not like people aren't doing it but it's the, it's the harder part of it and he said that you know people who started seven years ago they have there's muscle memory Whereas Absolutely. people who started last yeah. May, yep. it's like, oh, AI summaries, AI summaries, you know? yeah. yeah, so. Yeah, there's no question to that. And um, the, how do I say this? A lot of the CEOs are are just, like I said, they're just floundering right now. They're like, and I, I, I think they're waiting for the, um, that solution that they can launch. Um, that would provide that differentiation or distinction mm -hmm. that they're looking for. And like you said, um, I think the problem with that is, is that if they're waiting for a vendor to do it, it's going to be consumed by many potentially. Right. Yep. Um, so there won't be that differentiation or distinction, right? right? So yep. um, I, I've also noticed when I was at the IT Expo, for example, that no one really talked about getting an OLM or doing their own uh, development uh, with an AI. Many of them were, um, other than the person I shared a stage with, obviously, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. by and large, most of them were not looking to develop something unique. Um, they were looking for um, something that was really just bolt on. Uh, they're looking mm -hmm. for something. Mm -hmm. that's, and again, there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, obviously if you have customers, you're going to be able to sell that to their, to your customer because you're going to come with that trust already, right? They already know right. you. They're, they're already yeah. paying you. So it's a lot easier to add money to an existing bill than it is to a brand new vendor. I get that. But I don't think it's going to create a, an iconic or distinctive brand for them um, putting on my marketing ad here. Um, it's just going to give them another Me Too product that they can sell. And they may do very well at selling it. And they may have a better marketing department, better sales department. Sure. And they may do better, but it's still not necessarily the same as having that, um, you know, that unique um, product or, or, or service to offer. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I, that was interesting. Yeah, I was so I, you just stemmed a thought that I'm gonna throw you a curveball. Maybe it's maybe it's a curveball. Maybe it's not a curveball. But there are two thoughts that I had uh, earlier on, and just now I had, had uh, an additional one. One is you know really that it's not necessarily um, the innovative part, but you know when you're looking to generate or, or develop something and have a moat uh, a protection against your uh, competitors, really a lot of that is the data, right? The data is like sure. your, your freaking platinum, right? Like mm -hmm. it's the thing that is extremely valuable. So the, the interesting APIs that expose data in certain ways that other ones aren't exposing data in, right? That right. is, that is where I think the huge innovation can really happen. And guess what? communications is pretty effing interesting like in that respect <laughs> yes, right yes so yes. here which leads to my curveball question and again <laughs> answer this however you want but okay. what do you think are some interesting opportunities in the communication industry for oh. using ai that just are on tap and you don't have to give anyway any secret sauce whatever i just want to get your thoughts on this um wow that's a very loaded question but uh, sure is. um so I think that AI can be used first. We should look internally, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I hear everyone talking about the technology to the customer side, but I hear very, I, I don't hear a lot of the CEOs and a lot of the business owners talking about the benefits to its own team, right? So they're yep. looking at how to mm -hmm. commoditize and monetize going externally. So first thing I would do is if you want buy-in for selling AI, mm -hmm. let your team use AI. That's great. So I think yep. a lot of business owners should be looking internally and telling their teams, which we did at Green Star Marketing, for mm -hmm. example. Um, yeah, my senior director would probably chuckle if she if she saw this uh, interview, because I would always say to her, "Well, what about AI? What about this? What about this?" And finally, <laughs> it was let your team pick what they want to use. Right? If they like a certain product, you know, mm -hmm. um, let them use it, let them experiment with it, and come back with the results, and then the team can start to embrace it and adopt it. So that's what we're doing at Green Star is we're in. We're letting the team collectively utilize the products and find the ones that work for them. Mm -hmm. We're also making sure that we are sensitive to the things um, that could hurt our customers when it comes to marketing and AI. Um, as you might have just seen recently, uh, Google has decided to de-index search results for people that are just, I'll call it spam, spamming yeah. out AI-generated content without any meaningful human 
um, interaction with it or any mm-hmm. anything that's going to be substantially beneficial to the community or to the ecosystem. And so, you know, you, you start to do that. And the next day you, you realize you're not even showing up on search results. You're not even there. You're de-indexed. Right. Um, and they're doing it on YouTube channels as well. Um, I, I, I kind of understood the Google search. I didn't realize that Google was going to go down the YouTube channels and they are as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's something that I think I would tell CEOs to look at. And I think that's an opportunity is look mm-hmm. inward, right? And and don't just look at it from the um, technology side. Help your finance department. Let them experiment. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's, mm-hmm. there's something that they can do. Um, you know, business processes, support and service, all those types of things. Now, going externally, Mike, mm-hmm. I think the sky's the limit. I, I, I think that um, anywhere you see a niche or an opportunity to solve a problem, mm-hmm. AI may be one of those solutions that gets it done or could be part of that equation. Mm-hmm. Um, so rather than say, oh, they should build an, you know, a virtual assistant that pops up and does this, that, and the other, that's yeah, all yeah. great. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be better for me to say to someone, find, you know, find what you're good at, find what you enjoy. You know, if your organization is communications, for example, why are you doing this? And what verticals do you enjoy working in? What are those problems that you keep experiencing over and over? You know, in the old days, we would say, if, you, if it keeps happening, find a way to automate it, right? Yeah. Right. Today, I'm going to change that and say, if it keeps happening, find a way to make AI take care of it. Yep. Right. Right. I mean, that, that, that's great. And honestly, that, that's a perfect answer too. Like I, I didn't necessarily need anything very specific. Now, now one thing that I am wondering about, and again, you may or may not be able to talk about this, but with that new, uh, is it Helios product, the, the CX product? Are you yeah, yeah, able yeah. to talk about the kind of stuff that you're doing with that and where, where that brings a uh, unique advantage to the, to the people, your customers? Absolutely. Certainly at a high level, right? So yeah, at a high um, level. So, is fine. Yeah. so Helios is a uh, partnership with P2P and a company that's based out of uh, China and Singapore. Um, so they do some of the development. We should do some of the development. Mm-hmm. And that product is an omni-channel CX with generative AI for knowledge base and for um, you know doing things for like um, uh, the customers coming into your call center, for example, or for knowledge base for your agents, for example. Um, so let me talk about omnichannel for those that don't that aren't in the contact center world. So omnichannel is the ability to have more than just voice, right? So in a call center, you have voice. In a contact center, we want to also be able to handle web chat off your website. We want to be able to handle SMS and MMS for texting. We want to be able to have Facebook Messenger. We want to, we want to be able to respond to WhatsApp. And again, in this country, people go WhatsApp, but but in other countries, WhatsApp is very popular. Matter of fact, in some countries, it's the number one. Um, talk uh, and communications tool, Mm -hmm. uh, Brazil, India, for example. So what we're doing is we're creating a single pane of glass, bringing all that into one single pane and allowing the, that agent to basically respond regardless of the channel of communication. That's the omni or Mm multi-channel coming in the CX or customer experience. Part of it is it, 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 it does have workflow capabilities. It does have the ability to, um, tie into the generative AI. Um, so it can answer and do things like off of your knowledge base. So it can, it can, it can solve problems quickly and efficiently. Um, so it's a relatively low cost, very light. Um, and it's not, um, specific to one platform. So we've made it so that it's agnostic, um, so that it can work off of multiple platforms. Um, so it makes it easy to essentially, tie into your communication that you already have. So you don't have to necessarily do a heavy forklift. You can layer this right on top and away you go. Yep. Nice. Absolutely. That's yeah. super cool. Yeah, no, I, it's it's always interesting to me. Like, I, I think you're right when you said it a few minutes ago. Sky's the limit. Like, truly, Absolutely. the sky's Absolutely. the limit. There's just, and so with, to reiter, what, reiterate what Dave said related to that earlier too, is the sky is the limit what you sense the sky's the limit. You don't want to just be throwing effort in all directions. You want to find the problems and then you solve the problem, right? It's just like any business, right? Find the problems and you find and and build a solution. Don't build a solution for something that hasn't been identified as a problem. So, uh, and, and I think that's just good practice all around. So no, thanks. And I appreciate, uh, you going into some details on like the different aspects of, uh, where CER, uh, CEOs are at right now, right? Because I do think 
that floundering is probably a, a, the word I've <laughs> used or, or heard, uh, you know, in, in so many different words, but it's like that, that I've heard, I've heard that, uh, people, you know, they know there's some opportunity and it's, they, yes. they have no idea how to benefit from it or even to help benefit their customer base. Because a lot of CEOs, like they're not just thinking about like, Oh, what's the upside in it directly for me and the finances, like solving problems for your customers is how you succeed. Right. And it's, yes. it's really finding those problems that AI can solve. So it's the same across the board. You got to find the problems and how can we solve them? Right. It's one of the reasons with Helios that we added the generative AI. Originally, that product was just an omni-channel solution, mm -hmm. but we wanted to give our, our our customers and the end user the ability to benefit from, from generative AI in a real way, in a substantive way, and it, and it, and it, and we wanted them to be confident, right? So, mm -hmm. um, they want to dip their toe in the pond. We're going to let them kind of swim in the shallow end of the pool. Okay. But this yeah. should get them excited about what else they can do, whether it's with Helios or whether it's with other products and services or other, uh, you know, other AI engines, if you will. That is truly why I, I'm excited about Helios, for example. It's not really just about just selling that product. It's also the fact that this should get them thinking about other things that they want to do with AI. Because right now, again, they see these examples, they see these webinars where they, where people are showing them how they created a, a great piece of art in less than two minutes. You know, we, we, we see all the, we see all this upside, right? We see all this creativity. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, then the owner of the company or the CEO will say, okay, well, how do I take that and hand that to my team? And what, am, and, and, and what's even my, what's my risk? So my, what's my cost benefit, my risk assessment. And then like, what should I expect back? When yeah, should I expect have, yeah. it, right? Like, yeah, what's my ROI, ROI? I mean, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yep, yes. Yeah. Setting, yeah. setting those expectations and, and then, you know, and also measuring, okay, we expected this. I think that's one of the most important things with AI is like, again, we don't just want to shoot bullets in every direction. And if we do, we want to measure how far they went and what was the game, <laughs> right? Or, or not. Correct. And right, so, right. Uh, and so I think that that's a, uh, just a best practice to, you know, as you're uh, evaluating tools, let's say, you know, you've given your team a small budget or whatever, or, or a large budget, right? And they're trying out these tools, have them document their experiences, right? Where they're seeing gains, where they're not, you know, yep. because the reality is we, um, we only have a finite amount of energy effort and capital right so that, that's a great got, segue mike um just to add there um a lot of ceos don't realize that there's a lot of free and low cost ai training yep. coursera yeah. um i've seen some other conferences um yep. where they're adding a lot of ai training you know for again next to nothing or or nothing yeah. um let your team take those courses um, they're relatively short but again some familiarity will start to promote them using that product. Sorry to interrupt you, Mike, but I just, that was that, such a great segue there on, hey, yeah. there, there are tools out there for learning about this too. Yeah, well, one of the things I heard recently that I thought was great is, you know, use AI to find AI, right? I mean, there's actually, you, you can do that. And, and one of the things I'm just gonna plug really quick, and we mentioned <laughs> in our newsletter a few weeks ago, but I'm hearing more and more about it. Like again, at that at that summit I was at, like the, the AI panelist, one of the guys was saying, hey, I actually unsubscribed to ChatGPT and now I use Perplexity completely and, and they're the same <laughs> price. Perplexity right. is a wrapper around OpenAI's ChatGPT, but right. it's very good at like, searching, researching, giving, you know, like ChatGPT right. gives you the sources and whatnot, but they've really optimized it as an engine to be oh, able cool. to like research and quickly get the answers and understand transparency wise, where those answers came from, why those right. answers. So right. uh, perplexity, I would say there's a free version too. I've just been, I'm like, well, gosh, these guys, these really smart guys, like cancel their chat GPT. I'm like, I'm not going to do that yet because we're using chat GPT team for work, which keeps our data private, which is huge. Right. Yes. But yes. I, but I have started using perplexity and uh, for searching, I, I'd say it's, it's just, it's just fantastic. So again, it's just, some of this is just playing around with things and yes. a, perplexity is an AI tool that can help you find other AI tools that you maybe solve your specific problem, right? I mean, and and that's a that's another concern for CEOs. Um, I didn't hear it 
too much at IT Expo, but I have heard it when I'm talking to them on more of a one-on-one -on -one basis, right? Um, is will that particular AI solution be around six or 12 months from now? Because we've seen sort of these hype cycles of AI where these, oh, yeah. these companies get this mass adoption, or at least there's a lot of interest, but they're, but they're not charging. So there's no money behind them or there's very little. And then the, and then the concern is, well, are they still going to be there? So do I want to build my tool around that particular LLM if it's not going to be around? Right. So I have heard those types of conversations again, not so much at it expo. Um, but definitely when I'm having my one-on-ones with customers and we're just talking tech, you know, we're talking shop, if you will. Um, and that's why I, I put this in quotes where I said chat GPT was simply that, you know, I call that the safe one because it's, it seems it's the Cisco. Like it's the Cisco right. of AI, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody yes. ever got fired for using ChatGPT. Right. Maybe right. they did, but it's funny you mentioned. <laughs> well, I, I think there's an attorney out there that would. Probably, yeah, uh, you know what? Uh, right. we're gonna, we're gonna there's at least that one that we know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that too, because one of the things Mike and I talk about is being nimble in the space, and and we talk about that hype cycle because a lot of people get these great ideas, and we've seen it from the time we started this podcast, and now where here's this wonderful tool, and we go crazy with it, and next thing you know, it's a plugin, right, to Chat GPT, and now Correct. the plugins are going away from Chat GPT, and now it's a part of GPT, you know, like yeah, all right. by itself, you know, so. Right. Um, we're going to see a lot of that. So it will take people not building tools that are s simply built on, you know, one of these uh, AIs. And then how do they yeah. get around that going forward? It's building one, yeah. one building your house on sand. One hat, one strategy I think is really good. And funny enough, perplexity uses this strategy as being able to uh, having the ability to use pluggable LLMs. So what nice. that, what that means is perplexity yes. Claude three just came out. That's Anthropics product, and they they already wrapped it. You know what I mean? It's like a so so the the ability to have use one let's call it backplane and yes. plug in multiple LLMs and use what you need, even for different use cases, right? Because sometimes one yes. LLM will be more optimized for a certain use case, and another one will be optimized for a different use case. You can actually set it up to where okay, if it's this type of thing, use mm -hmm. this LLM. And I, I, I knew that trend would happen. Like Rico, we talked about it a year ago almost, right? Yes. And it, it, it is happening. So when you, when you do build your house, mm -hmm. build it to be able to, to be on a different few, like uh, here, here's a good one. I uh, have <laughs> multiple electrical grids plugged in, right? You want to be on the overlapping yeah. electrical grid there, right? So you want to have a, a pluggable LLMs because yeah, I mean, we, we don't know what's going to come and go. Or here's another one, arms race, right? Which one's going to be better this week? Yes. Gemini Ultra, the blah, yeah, blah, Gemini. blah. Color. Gemini Ultra generated <laughs> all these bias him and racist images. You know, like it's it's the stuff changes all the time, right? Yep. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of like, you know, you used electric as having two power grids. I would I would say since we're we're both we both are in the uh, telecom space with two Internet providers coming to your home or to your business. Right. You yeah. want that failover. You want that backup. You want that assure that that disaster recovery concept. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, even Helios, right? We 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 natively kind of default to Chat GPT four, but we do allow. Um, I think it's Octo and Gemini mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and Anthropic uh, as options. Um, you know, as a hybrid model. You know, so we did that out of the gate. Like that was just table stakes for us to have a couple other options sitting there. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just from us just talking. You know, collectively as 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 developers and builders of the product, saying what would we, what would we like to see. You know at least for version one like what what do we think is required and again that's back to that buy-in right having the yeah. team communicate and talk asking customers um what they're looking for and then trying to you know match those but also keep a cost you know a cost uh, in line with what we think they need for an smb you know play not just you know big enterprise so right it's very right. important and, and, that, and that applies to applications and other development too mike not just ai but i think that rigor around you know, what you do there um, needs to definitely be applied to, to AI as well. No question. I, I would totally agree with that. Now, thinking about, you know, let's say trends and whatnot. So, you know, we're in 2024. We're solidly grounded. What do you think the next year looks like, Dave, as far as AI in general, uh, upsides, downsides, everything in between? 
So definitely in the communication sector, I think we're going to see an upswing in the next 12 to 16, 18 months of uh, virtual assistants. I think we're going to see graphical avatar um, virtual assistants that will either be of the you know, humanoid looking, very, very human looking, or they can be obviously the com the comedic or, you know, cartoon yeah. uh, avatars that we're also used to. I think that's going to come. I think the, uh, the days of call center and contact center where you have to st sit on hold and, and wait for a queue to be responded to and skill sets that have to be addressed based on availability of, of staff. I think that all goes away. Mm -hmm. I think in the next couple of years, you're going to see that I don't, I will immediately get a virtual assistant. That virtual assistant will probably be able to handle a very large amount of the requests that I would want, whether it's a, an airline ticket or whether it's a refund. Um, call it the Amazon concept, where I don't think I'm ever gonna have to talk to an agent there or very few times, right? right. Um, and so I think that's what's coming um, in the communication sector. Um, and then, of course, all the things that we're doing today, I think, just get improved with AI, right? Mm -hmm. um, data analysis, cybersecurity, all those things are just going to be ratcheted up because of the power of AI, right? What it can do, um, the fact that it thinks in an exponential squared type of, of way, which pe pe we just don't. Like, that's just not in our right. brain. So I think those are the types of things I think we should be looking for in the next, you know, year to, to 18 months. Um, to go out any farther than that, Mike, I don't know. Um, you know, um, the, the, I don't think, again, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't know if I want to talk <laughs> about, like, I feel like, I feel like let's just take this thing in year segments here, right? Well, like, yeah, yeah, like yeah I mean, at the, at, you know, at the one session we were, I was jokingly saying, do, hum do humans even fit in, uh, or even survive in an AI generated world, right? That was just a question I posed in a, in a kind of, you know, tongue in cheek. Uh, manner but the reality is is there you know there are some people out there that are questioning where we fit into this evolution if you will right um i again i'm not i'm not a cynic i don't think it's going to be to that degree mm -hmm. um but i do think it does affect people right sure. i mean anytime you have innovation or change you know um you know the buggy whip you know is no longer really necessary because cars have replaced right, right? Yeah. and right. you know i mean and, and trains really aren't used for you know passenger travel because people like their independence with cars right so again mm -hmm. you know those in, those innovations change the way we behave right um i would also argue that you know anytime we we have software or ai or any, any anything for that matter where we should look at the incentives and that will probably tell us where it's going to go Right. What yeah. is the incentive? Right. What 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 is that company trying to achieve um, and what's the incentive behind it? Um, right. And hopefully, you know, hopefully AI is used mostly for good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, um, again, good. who knows? Right. I mean, I, if I owned a crystal ball, if I was omnipotent, um, although even that's a question, right, is is AI becoming a form of its own omnipotent uh, entity? Um, so a lot of sure. cool conversations at IT Expo, by the way, that were all around this type of, nice. you know, theoretical. Um, mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say just one thing on the on your point, and you brought up social media earlier, and you know, segueing into like its impact on society. Um, you know, virtual girlfriends, we're seeing like GPT versions of them where people have, you know, that type of thing. And the reality mm -hmm. is, is that 2024 is kind of a tough year for uh, polarization. And sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. people don't want to talk to other people. And there are many opportunities around that where people may switch to having either, you know, a device, you know, what, what is it? Uh, I forget the movie, but they say Dave in the movie. What? You don't want to talk oh, about your Hal, Hal, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so you have yeah, you know one of those devices in your house, or you have like a Rosie the robot that's cleaning up around mm -hmm. the house, you're having conversations with whatever the case may be. Right, definitely. Some right, social a, there. yeah, and the social and the, and the social dilemma there is AI um, caused the social uh, the, the, the social problems that we're having most likely, or at least some of them, right? right? Facebook's the algorithm, yep. yes, because yeah. again, their incentive was to get your attention. Right. So, it, and, it, and, and AI figured out that going to the bottom of the brainstem, going to the lowest common denominator, which is let's play off of each other's, yeah, you know, oh, I got a um, like, so I'm gonna go, and, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. it it learned what it needed to do to keep your attention, 
Right. The problem is, is it didn't help society. Now, here's what's funny. AI with Rosie the Robot and or a girlfriend, if it prevents the suicide of someone, would Correct. still be better yep. than not having anything. So it's kind of a double-edged sword here where there sure. could be some benefits from AI to solve the problem that one could argue that social media created with a different AI or a different algorithm. Um, so again, that's why I say I'm not cynical. I, mm-hmm. I think there's hope. I think there's things that will definitely come that can solve some of these problems. But that comes back to that. Does the moral and ethical align with the digital and AI frameworks of our society? Yep. And I don't think they always will. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're aware of that, right? I mean, social media, for example, promised so many good things, right? Right. We're gonna, we're all gonna sing Kumbaya. We're gonna love what we do. Uniting um, the world. You know, we're going to be connected. We're going to see all our old friends from high school and elementary school and all the, and families will be connected. And what we've seen is nothing but the opposite. We've seen right. marginalized people, polarized people. It um, being weaponized against its users right? or, or, or yeah, right? censorship, right? All, all of those yeah. things. And that's, and that's a simple weaponization. So everyone's so worried about AI from like a police state con- concept, right? That we see in the Hollywood movies, right? Where AI, yeah. and it is doing it to some extent, right? It already right. is marginalizing like if you're already you know if you're already have a low credit score ai unfortunately has actually the bias regrettably biased itself to not want to give them credit uh, even when they are allowed to from from right. a marginalized perspective or the police state concept right we don't want ai trying to identify targets that are biased unfairly mm-hmm. right right at least not in our country, right? So, right. you know, so again, that's the concern that I would have is we've got to make sure that we get this one right because I don't mm-hmm. think we got social media completely right. Yep. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that it's, you know, there are definitely good things about social media. Mm-hmm. I have yep. seen friends and I have met people I haven't seen in 15, 20 years. So there is always some good. Yep. Yeah. But then the question is, was the good worth the bad? Right. Right. That yeah. cost benefit analysis, if we put back the CEO hat on. So I just think we need to be very careful with that. Um, that's that's just my opinion. Obviously, it's, it's a great take. Yeah. yeah, that's that that is a great take. And you know, one of the things you know, we're talking about the whole like leaning towards the human side or the you know the all automated. And how do we fit in and whatnot? Uh, right. Rico and I have had a whole bunch of conversations about that, and uh, we're actually uh, we're in touch with a group called the Human Side of AI. Uh, and, and, and it's, it's a great group, you know, to, to really address just that. Right. Yes. And uh, what I've realized funny enough as it started get AI podcast, doing all the stuff, actually Rico, we both understood the stand this a lot more now is the importance of keeping the human aspect in it. It's yep. not just for the sake, it's for the sake of the betterment, uh, and continue, you know, it's not just like for our continuation, <laughs> the reality is like it, we as individuals do make this world better, you know, and, and, you know, the algorithms to some point might uh, take us down a path. And like you said, the whole credit score thing, it's like, just because it doesn't mean that every case is like that. Right. And the, and I think that individualism is something that's some very important to preserve. Um, yeah. You know, Dave, you, you, we've talked about this a little bit with, with green star, right. With your marketing, you're, you're not just letting it fly, right. Actually you, one of your advantages is actually the opposite is to keep the human side very much intact. And, uh, and so I, I think that that perfectly aligns with, with Rico and I and our thought and the whole human side of AI thing in that group. I mean, it, there, it's good to know that there are advocates for keeping things human as well, right? The, these tools should augment and enhance, not replace, in my mind. I, I would agree. Um, you know, you mentioned Green Star Marketing. Um, again, my team, as I mentioned earlier, does use different forms of, of, of AI tools. But, you know... Um, we're looking for another content writer, for example, yeah. right? I mean, literally right now, that's got the knowledge of the industry because we don't just want to put out stuff, spam. Right. We don't just want right. to put out content for the sake of content. It has to be meaningful. It has to be something that people would want to read. And there's a reality that when a person puts their heart and soul because they love to write content into that document, it's going to have something there that just connects with the other person 
Whereas if you just put content out to say, oh, I put out seven blogs and a human being can only do six. So There's what? No soul to it. Right. Read it. Right. There's right. literally no soul to it. Yeah. And, no. and then on top of it, if we know that Google's already penalizing for that type of behavior, just using AI, then why are you doing it? Like for the right. sake of what, like what, I mean, you're, you're just, you know, you're just putting out stuff that there's, there's nothing behind it. Um, so let's not, hu- let's not lose our humanity. Yeah. Um, you know, at that, at that IT expo, I, I mentioned that, you know, this might be our maturity test um, for what it means to be human mm-hmm. um, with AI, right? And I don't want to overstate the implications of AI. There's many other things that are also at risk, right? I mean, um, you know, 80 years ago when Oppenheimer, you know, invented the nuclear bomb, uh, the A-bomb, if you will, um, everyone thought the world was going to end. And here we are 80 years later, nine countries have the bomb. So the whole world isn't nuclear. Not, you know, right. I mean, I mean yeah. I'm not saying it, it, it could be wor- it could be worse. Yeah. So all I'm trying to say is, is, you know, um, we, we have to have some perspective yeah. on where we're at. Um, now, jokingly, though, I, I, I was talking about the Oppenheimer moments um, that, that occur. Yeah. And a friend of mine said, yeah, but, uh, you know, when you build an A-bomb, it doesn't make itself better and stronger and all that. And yet with, with AI, it trains yeah. itself, it makes itself better and faster and stronger. And I jokingly laughed and said, yeah, you're you're not wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you, know, you, you, you know, a 50 megaton bomb is going to stay 50 megaton as it sits there. Um, you know, so again, it just means that I think we have to just have that maturity test. Are we... Yeah ready to take this on uh, and i think we are um but i think again um the arms race analogy um is a perfect one we don't have to necessarily rush into everything all at once because that's what happened with social media no. we got ahead of ourselves and we didn't understand the social implications and ramifications of just blindly thinking that this was going to be all great um, just because right. we called it social, um, it's man, anything uh, but social. Yeah. Or the man behind the curtain, too. I, I you know, I'm, I, I hate yeah. to come across like that all the time, but uh, that's the truth. And you and I had talked about before when we met a few weeks yeah. back about uh, the information <laughs> bias and you know who's Absolutely. feeding them and how do they build these models and what does that mean for the rest of us? And mm-hmm. it's a perfect opportunity for nefarious actors that we may not know behind the scenes to really control Absolutely. human behavior yet again, uh, as we found out with Facebook, right? I mean, we've seen the documentaries a few years back and that's what they found out was that they could actually change people's behaviors by you know letting a notification go off and then showing you these friends and not showing you these ones and if if if, um subliminal messages are illegal in advertising on a 15 or 30 second commercial how can these um algorithms and the way it learns how to bias and how it learns to marginalize and or polarize its audience where you're on there for four or five, six hours a day. Yeah. How can that not be a concern to just any average right. normal person? Like this is not, you know, we're not taking, trying to make a mountain out of a molehill, but just sure. think about that for a minute. Yeah. If yeah. a flash of a product, you know, on a commercial has a concern because it can change the way you see something, being barraged for hours and hours every single day it should be almost blatantly obvious that this could be bad right right Right. yeah no absolutely dave um now uh as we're wrapping up and uh winding down here did dave did you have any closing thoughts that you that you wanted to uh talk about um no i i i I, Yes. Uh, what I'm going to say is, is um, collectively, as your audience and others um, see this podcast, what I would ask them to think about is how do we come together to make sure that there is that standardization, there is that governance, that there's common sense regulatory, um, that we don't let our government overstep. But at the same token, we don't want them to be five years behind. Right. Because then it's not going to do us any good. Um, and the way to do that is to go to these events, um, these different trade shows, to join some organizations that deal with that deal with regulatory, um, and just be aware. Um, I was surprised at how many people um, didn't know about the deep fake in New Hampshire. Um, yeah, you know, it was missed in the news. Um, so just be aware of the fact and, and start with yourself. What are you doing, and what is your company doing? You know, if you have an employee that's using AI without any guide rails, there's there's no policy, you know, 
what data has been yeah. shared already. Right. Like, so in yeah. other words, so, so, you know, I, I would say get, get your managers involved, start to create a policy. It could be a simple framework for now. Um, and then, you know, you can start to tighten down on, and I like your, I like Martha, who I know, uh, I like Martha's don't do this. <laughs> yeah. Those should be pretty yeah. simple, right? Whatever yeah. those are for your organization, that should be where you start. Please don't do this. Right. And then you can branch out and say what's, you know, uh, acceptable. I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to prevent creativity. Right. We want to sure. let employees be able to feel like they're not being, you know, just, you know, pounced on or over, or there's so much mm -hmm. oversight that they're not, they lose that ability to maneuver. Um, but, you know, very quickly you can get yourself in trouble if you share that data. So yep. that's where I would leave it is, you know, be involved. Yeah, I, I really like what you said about awareness there. You know, this is something, especially with the deep fakes, Rico and I were talking about this. And like, even in your, so like, I don't really do anything on Facebook, but lately I've been doing small, little non-intrusive posts, just letting people know some very basic things, just to raise some basic awareness, right? And people could ignore it and that's fine. But I feel like we have a duty as the people who are on the forefront to let other people know that's actually what the podcast is all about. It's not for the people who already know a bunch about AI. It's right. actually for the people like the every, every person, let's call it that, right. you know, wants to know more and wants to understand, you know, both the upsides and the downsides. Cause we, we do not shy away from the implications on the show. We've always Absolutely. dove, we've always yeah. delved head first into those <laughs> it's upsides. And, it's, sorry, it's that, one that, of the that, reasons. Yeah, it's why I watch your show and I read your newsletter, guys, is because anywhere where I can gather some information uh, and then I try to disseminate that to my teams as well so that they actually have the ability then to watch the things that I think are relevant. But then they can also, you know, go down roads that they would like to 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 investigate yes. maybe for their particular role or responsibility in the organization. So, you know, keep keep doing what you guys do. Um, but I also think that, uh, um, you know, companies need to start realizing um, you know, that there's some responsibility here with this. Yeah, it's Absolutely. here. It's not going away. No, yeah, it, it, is, it is not going away. Like you said, <laughs> you couldn't stuff bottle. this back in the box. Like, <laughs> right. it, it's, no. it's the cat's out of the bag. The cat is yes. out of the bag, folks. Yes. So, excellent. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and round the episode down. Dave, thank you so much for oh, being yes, on the Fantastic. show. <laughs> It's, it's been a pleasure. A we, love, we love talking to you. I love that we, you know, we, we were able to get your take on the panel, you know, the, um, the, really the temperature of AI and, you know, what you're, what people are thinking about in, in your industry and sector, uh, because you have, you, you know, you, you have a lot of, uh, communication with, with CEOs and founders and whatnot. So you really got to have a great pulse on, uh, on, on that from the, uh, the business standpoint, right? And it's good to, uh, you know, it's definitely good to uh, to forge forward, but we also have to always proceed with caution, right? So it's the uh, the whole risk worth re versus reward thing. And, uh, and I don't blame anybody, you know, like you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, hey, let's see, see what our vendors will build into their products. That's not the worst strategy in the world. If you haven't been doing, if you haven't been building and you don't have a staff that's like, uh, ML engineers and ML right. ops, and you're not ready. Like the, probably one of the better strategies is to two things. I'm just going to iterate one thing as we're closing down. One of the sure. things that really hit me and I believe is hundred percent true. Have your internal people have an awareness and an understanding and let them experiment and play yes. safely, get yes. a, get, get a strategy in place, get a, you know, get, a. Uh, um, you know, uh, the policy rules of too. operation and the policy yes. that needs yes. to be there. I, 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 I liked it, likened it to, um, you know, before you give somebody a chainsaw, make them do the training, right? <laughs> like have an understanding you you right. use the nail gun analogy. And I think, you know, it's the same type of thing. Like people need to understand what to do, what never to do. And also you want to breed curiosity and experimentation. And, and um, somebody said it recently, they were like, you know, your people who are going to adopt AI are the people who like to tinker, right? They may yeah. not even come up with something that's, you know, concrete and we're going to use all the time, but they're tinkering and they're thinking about the problems versus what they could do and right. where those, where the, where you actually meet with that bridge and you can that then you can deploy solutions 
and automate away the, you know, the mundane stuff, the boring stuff, the stuff that I have AI do is the stuff I never want to do. You know what I mean? So I, 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 I could agree more, Mike, when it comes to automation, anything that can be done over and over again, that is mundane and boring should be automated. And whether that's with AI or some other tool or other software or whatnot, absolutely. Totally agree. They're, they're you know, people can do better things with their time um, yes. and more and more enjoyable for them and probably more profitable for the company. Right. I mean, oh, at the yeah. end of the day, you yep. know, it, it's a win win. Right. They get to do what's more exciting, um, requires more brain power. Um, let them let them be creative um, and let let these other things get done through automation and A.I. No question. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what I loved about your take about giving it to the employees, having their buy and let them experiment. Because even though you're not pitching that out to external customers, your internal customers, you're making money because you're automating processes. That's where the yeah. money savings, you know, comes Absolutely. from. That's where the benefit right. comes from. Yep. And then your employee will evangelize that to the external customers yep. and yep. tell them what they're doing. And then what happens is those customers may not have an AI specialist or have someone that they think can handle that or maybe they don't have that bandwidth and then that becomes an opportunity for you right yeah yep. bosses yeah, let absolutely. me cheat and use chat gpt <laughs> exactly yeah. well and yeah. and that's the thing i early on uh early last year i read something and it was like um you know you need to cheat and i was like with the ai stuff i, I mean it's like calculators were cheating many years ago you know what yeah. i mean i think about it like that it's like there are a lot of things that used to be considered cheating and now there, why would you ever, like somebody was talking about verifying all of the chat GPT results and different stuff. And I know Dave, you talked about it in a different context, which I think is smart to track it and a monitor and understand what's being done. But they were talking about, think about nowadays, uh, actually I'll, I'll, I'll mention a story. They were talking about Gutenberg when he originally had the, uh, built that first printing press and he wanted to get some adoption around it. So what right. he did was he said, okay, you know what? I will print, you know, a hundred, uh, you know, books for this religious, uh, you know, organization, right. And uh -huh. give them to the Bishop and, you know, he could distribute them and let's get some adoption around this, this printing for this, this, this Gutenberg, right. Being able to switch things around and not have to build a whole new printing press for each, each page. Right. And so he did that. He sent them over and then he's like a week later, he's like, uh, oh, I haven't heard back. And he doesn't want to be rude. Then another week, he's like gently throwing in a, a couple things. And one of the bishop's assistants was like, well, you know, the bishop is a very busy man. And, you know, he he doesn't have a lot of time. He hasn't he hasn't proofread all hundred copies yet. <laughs> I'll leave it on that. I mean, that's all I, you know, I, I think about that. So we have to, we have to keep that in Like we, we don't want to charge forward without thinking, but there's yeah, right. a point where we have to trust our calculators to like, we don't, and, and, and somebody mentioned like, it's like pr double checking your calculator. Do we do that? No, we don't. Right. There's a, at some point there will be a trust right now though, even the, even open AI and the different tooling vendors let you yeah. know this isn't perfect and trust them. It's not perfect. You know, I mean, it really it is, it, you know, yes, conversational AI and all this has come a long way. It's still, you need to trust, but verify with these tools. Yep. Uh, and I have to be honest, I verify just about everything. Yeah. Same. <laughs> Good. Yeah. You should. Yeah. I, I do too. Uh, but, I, yep. but it'll get better. Yeah, oh, yes. it'll get better. It's just like Windows 95, then Windows 98, then Windows 2000, <laughs> like true. XP. They're always, I mean, arguably uh, Vista did not make things better, but you know, <laughs> it, <laughs> but but you know, it led the it, it led the path for Windows 7 and everything else. But you know what you know what I mean though, right? These things are always getting better. How it is today, it, it's it's in the worst state it will ever be, right? We're yeah. only going to have progress, so it's only going to get better, right? So. Right. Uh, so I, I would say that there will be a point where, you know, AI tooling like this conversational AI, AI is just like a calculator. It can be trusted. Right. So I would agree. Yep. I would agree. Awesome. Exciting times. Exciting times. Well, Dave, thanks. Thanks again for being yeah, thanks, on man. Rico. Uh, you, you know, I think that, uh, this was a great episode, excited Fantastic. to release this. And yep. I promise I will actually wait till March 21st to release this episode, <laughs> even right. though I want to just, even it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, and we will post guys. the link. Yep. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was just going to add that. We will post the link uh, to the expo, the IT expo that you did to. Yes. Uh, I, I know me personally, I picked up uh, Bill's book as a result Rookie of watching CEO. it. Yep. Uh, they were buying up. Mike a copy over there. So, yeah, thanks again, Dave. So that's oh. all I want to say, Mike. Gentlemen, awesome. thank you so much. And, uh, you know, when it comes out, I'll make sure I uh, post it on all the different social media platforms um, so that people can see it. And I know you guys are going to have it on the different podcast channels, yeah. et cetera. So, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Awesome, awesome. Thanks Dave. Again, Dave. Well, thanks so much. Yep. Have a great one. Yeah. See you All right. Later. Have a good night, guys. Talk to you later. Yep. Bye. See ya. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. Just wrapped up a wonderful interview with Dave George. Uh, Rico, uh, I, you know, why don't you close us off tonight? Sure. I would just say, you know, it was wonderful to have uh, Dave on the show tonight. He's a friend of the show, as we said uh, at the start of the episode, reads our newsletter, you know, loves our content, tells other folks about it, has amazing insights as a CEO. Uh, it was a real privilege to have him on the show tonight. So uh, we hope to have other guests in the near future. We had our AI roundtable. We'll have more of those coming up in the near future. So uh, thanks, everybody, for watching, and we'll see you next time here in the lab.